In continuum mechanics, we often encounter uh, quantities known as fields, and we also need to know what their derivatives are, so their rates of change. Um, so if we consider a continuum mechanical body, some solid body B, and we locate the points in the body by their position vector from the origin of a coordinate system, so we'll call that x, then whenever we attach a physical meaning to the body as a function of x, uh, then we'll have a field. So for example, we can have scalar fields. So let's say theta of x. So theta is a function that takes points in the body b. Just fix that there, a little typo. And returns to us a, a real number. Say theta is, say, the temperature field. And so that, that would be an example of a field. It's a scalar valued field. Uh, we can also have vector valued fields. So we can have a field V of x, and, and to each point B in the body, we can assign some vector in a vector space, capital V. So a, a, a common example of that would be, say, the displacement field or the velocity field of the body. So to each point x in the body, there's a vector value there for either the displacement or the velocity, or it could be the acceleration field. There are a lot of different fields that we could have that are vector valued. Uh, and we can also have tensor valued fields. So for instance, T of X would be a tensor field, and it would be a mapping, again, from points in the body B to the space of linear operators from vectors to vectors. So that's what this notation here means. So linear operators from vectors to vectors are tensors. And so to each point, in the body, we, we can attach a, a tensor, say the stress tensor, and we'd have the stress field. And these are the three types of fields that we're going to encounter in continuum mechanics, so scalar fields, vector fields, and tensor fields. And one of the most important things that we need to be able to do with fields is calculate their derivatives with respect to position. So we'd like to know how various field quantities vary from point to point and how fast they vary from point to point. So let's consider how we can calculate rates of change. So let's consider our, our body B again and look at a point X. Uh, and that's the location of the point relative to some coordinate system. And what I'd like to do is figure out how a field changes, let's say a scalar field, as we move from one point X to another. And so to, to be able to define that first, I'm going to define a direction. So let's define a direction H, and that will be a unit vector. So we have our, our unit vector here, h. Uh, and let's go ahead and plot in, in the vertical direction here a scalar field. Let's just call it theta. And so if I plot theta along this line that I defined using the direction h, uh, then I'm going to get a normal graph of a function. And the slope of that graph at x will then tell me the rate of change of theta in the direction of h. So this is sort of the concept of directional derivative. So the notation that we'll use is d theta of x uh, square bracket h. So h denotes the direction, and x is the point at which we're computing the rate of change. And the whole, this whole quantity here is the rate of change. And we can use the normal definition from calculus to figure what this is. We can define this directional derivative to be this limit of the value of theta evaluated at a point slightly displaced from x. So we'll take a point here, let's say x plus alpha h, where alpha is some small number. And we subtract it from the value at x. And then we divide through by alpha the distance that we, we shift it over. And then we take the limit as alpha, alpha goes to 0. And so that gives us the definition for the directional derivative. Uh, you can expand this out and manipulate it a little bit and you can find out that this expression can be written as the derivative of theta evaluated at x plus alpha h taking the derivative with respect to alpha so just a scalar and then setting alpha equal to zero and so this relationship here is really a very nice operational definition for the directional derivative because it allows you to very easily calculate the directional derivative um, let me point out that in, in, in normal situations, uh, 
that this directional derivative as an operator on H will be a linear operator on H. And we call that linear operator the gradient of theta. So, and there's two common notations. One is we'll write grad theta of x. Another one is this notation where you use the upside down triangle or the nabla sign. So these are two different ways of writing down the same concept. We'll, we'll mostly stick with this notation here. Okay, and so this, this allows you to sort of, in a compact way, compute all the rates of changes of theta in all directions h. So you, you calculate the gradient of theta and then you just apply it to whatever direction you want. Uh, this first way of doing it gives it to you, gives you the rate of change in a particular direction h. But if you can separate h out from that relationship, then you're left with the gradient. So let's go ahead and look at an example just to make this concrete. So I'm going to take a function theta of x, which is equal to the sine of x dot x. And let's go ahead and find the directional derivative. And then let's go ahead and determine what the gradient is. So the first step is to simply apply the definition that we've constructed here. So this is d theta of x evaluated in the direction h. So all I do is every every place I see an x in my original function, I replace it by an x plus alpha h. And now what I'm going to do is just take a derivative with respect to the scalar alpha. And so I'm going to need the chain rule to get inside the sign, and then I'm going to need the product rule because I have two alphas multiplying each other. So if I do that, the derivative of sine is cosine. And so I'll get cosine of alpha, uh, x plus alpha h dotted with x plus alpha h. And then I have to take the derivative of what's inside the argument there. And so I'm going to get h out of the first term dotted with x plus alpha h. And then I'll get x plus alpha h dotted with h. So that this term here, when I take the derivative of respect to alpha, I'm just going to get the h. And and the second term here, that just goes along for the ride. And then when I take the derivative of the second term, I'm going to pick up this h here. And the first term just goes along for the ride. And then all of this has to be evaluated for alpha equals 0. So when you set alpha equal to 0, lots of terms disappear. And we'll end up with cosine of x dot x times h dot x plus x dot h. And h dot x is equal to x dot h, so I can combine those two terms together. And I'll end up with 2 times cosine of x dot x times x dot h. And so that's the directional derivative. And you can see we can isolate the part that doesn't involve h, and that will be the gradient. So this very first part, 2 cosine of x dot x times x, that's the gradient of theta. And so you notice that I have a scalar function theta. And the gradient of theta, that's a vector. All right, so we have a number here, 2 cosine, and then it's multiplying into x, so we're going to get a vector for the gradient.